Today we're hosting Professor John Plakauer from John Hopkins University. John received his bachelor's degree at Trinity College of Cambridge University, and then he received his medical education at Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Krakauer is currently a John Malone Professor of Neurology, Neuroscience, and Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and a Director of the Brain Learning Animation and Movement Lab at the John Hopkins University. He's also an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute, and holds a visiting position at Champenemont Center for the Unknown in Lisbon, and the Zuckerman Institute at Columbia University in New York. His areas of interest range from motor learning to motor control, stroke and bioethics. And among other things, Dr. Krakauer is also a co-founder of a video gaming company and involved in the project named Kata, which develops therapeutic game design for rehabilitation and early stroke recovery. He's also an, the author of a recently published book, The Broken Movement, Neurobiology of Motor Recovery After Stroke. And the title of his talk today is Two Views of the Cognitive Brain. Before we start, please make sure that you are in mute mode, and I'd like to remind you that we allow questions during the talk, but there will be also time for questions at the end of the talk. So please welcome with me, Professor John Krakauer. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so yes, I, I was warned that this is a very interactive audience. Um, it's a great honor to be with you, even remotely. Um, and it's exciting to be able to give a slightly different kind of talk to one that I gave the last time I was there in person in Jerusalem many years ago. Um, I'm not going to give a long talk. This is a provocative ideas in evolution talk. It, this is actually a piece that I did with a philosopher called David Barak that is coming out in Nature Reviews Neuroscience in the next month or so. Um, so hopefully there'll be a more detailed way of reading this later. Um, but I'm going to just speak for about 15 minutes. You can, uh, you can interrupt, but I'm going to make it quick so that you can all throw tomatoes at me virtually for a longer period of time afterwards. Um, I'm just going to try and make an argument. It's going to be, I'm sure it's different from any talks you've received. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that's the last one, um, but maybe it would be by recency bias, the one that you remember. Um, so anyway, let's go. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start by just talking about um, discipline. So this is a bit of a cartoon. Um, about the disciplines and you can see there's a spectrum from sociologists to physicists and you can see the comment sociology is just applied psychology psychology is just applied biology biology is just applied chemistry which is just applied physics it's nice to be on top okay so you need to get get thinking here about what i would like to just call the sort of autonomy of the disciplines are they just a stopgap measure until everything will just be physics, okay? And I'm gonna make the case that the answer is obviously not, okay? The question is, is why not? Why is there fragmentation into the disciplines? Is it an epistemological problem for us as humans that we just have to divide the topics up like this because we can't think of sociology when we think of, by thinking about atoms? Or is it because it's actually ontologically correct to have autonomy of the disciplines? And I hope you'll see as we go why this is relevant, I think, to neuroscience. Okay. Now, Phil Anderson, the physicist, Nobel Prize winning uh, solid state physicist who died uh, last year, um, had a wonderful article, which I'm sure some of you are familiar, called More is Different, which was published in Science in 1972, where he made this claim as well. And you can see that here he was talking about um, the area X and the explanation Y. And what he says, and you can see similarly that you go all the way from elementary particle physics down to psychology and social sciences. It's very similar to the cartoon. And what he says, but this hierarchy does not imply that science X is just applied Y. In, at each stage, entirely new your laws, concepts, and generalizations are necessary, requiring inspiration and creativity to just as great a degree as in the previous one. Psychology is not applied biology, nor is biology applied chemistry. 
Okay, what I'm going to say is psychology is not neuroscience. And neuroscience is not going to somehow one day swallow up psychology. Okay, any more than sociology will be swallowed up by psychology. All right. All right. So here are the disciplines, sociology, economics, psychology, biology, chemistry, and I can't see, but it's physics to the right underneath the pictures of all your lovely faces. Um, and basically, we accept that these fields have overlapping, but also separate vocabularies, concepts, and explanatory objects. And in fact, you can do a kind of sort of interesting um, clear metrics now where you can look at papers and you can actually see how the vocabularies and concepts diverge and they don't diverge considerably. And this is a comment about this by the philosopher John Searle. Most types of real entities from split level ranch houses to cocktail parties, from interest rates to football games, do not undergo a smooth reduction to the entities of some fundamental theory. Why should they? And he's, in my view, completely correct. It would be very strange to say that in order to understand the concept of money, you need to know the structure of a banknote. Okay. So in other words, once one starts to be thinking this way, I'm hoping you know where I'm going. Why would we ever think that we're going to have a neuroscience explanation for a psychological or cognitive phenomenon? Okay. Let them just have their own separate vocabularies and concepts and explanatory objects. Right. Because if you do want to have a circuit-based explanation for cognition, well, let's just go all the way and have a quark theory of cognition while we're at it. Where do we bottom out? What explanatory object do we finish with? So I'm going to give a sort of fun example. Um, this is a philosopher, uh, Michael Strevens, um, who uh, is at NYU, I believe, and he's actually written a book recently on the history of science. And he basically puts it this way. Is it possible that the high level sciences neglect the low level mechanisms for principled reasons and will continue to do so even in, in their finished state? they need not and indeed should not draw on their lower level sciences for their explanatory content. Now, this is quite a strong statement, right? So this goes back to what I said before, is that there may be ontological autonomy, not just epistemological until we're finished. Okay, and I think depending on how this is said, somebody might go, well, yeah, we're not going to end up explaining a high level science using physics, so psychology will never end up being a physics discipline, but somehow people think it will become a neuroscience discipline. Okay, and the question is, is what's the difference? So this is a very nice example um, that uh, Michael Strevens gives, um, and basically an example uh, on the irrelevance of the causal underlayer, the case of golden moles and marsupial moles. Now, these are two kinds of moles. One is a marsupial and the other one is placental. In other words, they do not have, they do not share a phylogenetic origin, right? So marsupials uh, have a very different evolutionary and de developmental history to placental mammals. Okay. But they have remarkably similar phenotypes, thick fur, blind, snout and sharp claws. In other words, evolution has determined that there will be a phenotype based on a different mechanistic route to those phenotypes, but the explanation for their phenotype is their adaptive advantage. They like to burrow underground. So the logic here is the complete explanation for the team phenotype is its adaptive advantage. They have thick fur and blind and lots of smell, sense of smell and claws because that's the explanation for what the body type within constraints um, that you can have. The underlying mechanisms for the evolution of the phenotype will be different. Of course they will be. But if you include two in your explanation of one, 
then it won't be the same explanation anymore. In fact, in other words, including the lower level details has actually obscured the proper explanation, which is the same level one. Now, that doesn't mean that it isn't interesting to ask if you happen to be interested in evolution or development of a phenotype between a placental mammal and a marsupial. But for the explanation of the phenotype and its adaptive advantage, you don't have to go there. All right. So the reason why Strevens used this example was because evolution was telling us it, right? It's not us philosophers. It was saying, look, it will operate on whatever mechanism is necessary to converge on a phenotype that provides an adaptive advantage. All right. Can I, can I ask a question about this example? Sure. Would, would any two creatures, organisms, creations, um, who somehow need to like dig underground, uh, wind up at this, at this solution? Well, I mean, <clears throat> there are many examples of convergent evolution. Okay, and then one can, uh, one can ask, I mean, there's an interesting issue about, they can't both, they can't have propellers on their noses right? They, they can't have a drill bit because of constraints. But this argument about convergent evolution can be made many times over, which is that there's an adaptive advantage imposed by the environment, which is the explanation for the solution. Now, if you say um, that they're not exactly the same solution, and then you can find a difference, and then you say that difference must have an explanation that is not related to its adaptive advantage, then one would drop to level two. No, but I was focusing on the, on the similarities, but what you, the, the point of the constraints seems to be an important one. If they had different constraints, they could reach different solutions. They might wind up with a drill bit on their nose, right? Sure, but, if you, but nevertheless, if they wind up with a drill, it, but, that, but they're slightly different questions, right? The, the difference between are they similar and does their, does their phenotype explain the adaptive advantage versus how did they reach that similarity? Okay, and what I'm saying is you don't want to conflate those two types of question, right? So in other words, you're asking, and, and I'll actually give an example of the kind of question you're asking next, which is that you're asking, I want to know why they reach this kind of similarity and not another kind of similarity versus is the current state of their phenotype explainable for its adaptive advantage? To me, you, there, are, there are two separate questions being collapsed. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, okay. And I'll exp and let me just, I'll go into that a bit more next. Right, so what I'm trying to say then is that there are autonomous explanations, just that they're like there are autonomous disciplines. And so we have philosophy, sociology, social psychology, psychology, biology, chemistry, physics, and you have this axis, maybe of causality or complexity. And then maybe we should also think that the kind of science we do to explain action potentials and stretch reflexes and central pattern generators and eye movements and thinking are not all going to be the same anymore that explanations in physics are the same as they are in sociology. But what's happened is that we think that because we've done such a good job with action potentials and stretch reflex that we should keep on going. And the nature of the explanation will take the same form. It will be neurons and their connections and their circuits. So if we have a circuit explanation for the stretch reflex where you can actually show the 1A afferent connecting to the motor neuron and you can actually draw it in your mind and see the connectivity and the causality and the physical connectivity, that a similar type of explanation will eventually reveal itself with a circuit, let's say, in prefrontal cortex, where we'll have the same intuitive ability to simulate the connectivity and go, yeah, we now understand thinking. And what I'm trying to argue here is that trying to do neuroscience on thinking versus neuroscience on stretch reflex is as different as chemistry is from sociology. Okay. So I'm going to explain here the notion of first level explainers versus second level explainers. So in other words, if you wanted to ask, why did the ball break the window? Now, of course, you could be perverse and say the Big Bang, 
right? But I don't think it'd be particularly useful to say that the Big Bang explains why a ball broke the window. You talk about the hardness property of the glass and you talk about the momentum, the velocity and direction of the ball. So your first level explainers would be hardness of the glass and the ball and the velocity and direction of the ball. Now you could go down and say, well, I want to know why the ball was going at that particular speed in that direction. And then you'd have to say, well, someone threw it in that particular direction with that speed. And then you'd say, well, I want to know about the hardness of the glass. And then you'd start looking at the particular con you know, uh, configuration of oxygen and silicon to make up the glass. But those are second level explainers, okay? That you would not include those things in your explanation as to why the ball broke the glass, okay? And then if you wanted to know why do silicon and oxygen have the property they do, you'd go a level below. And if you wanted to know why the throwing led to the ball to go that direction, you'd start talking about the muscular skeletal properties of the arm and you could keep on going. And what I think happens is that people want to, they mistake when they have a second level explainer versus a first level explainer. Okay. So let's get to understanding. In other words, this is, you know, I saw on the Twitter feed that this is what I was talking about. Um, understanding and explaining are quite complex notions in science. Um, but I wanted to start by saying that I think the the, the project of fixing the brain, in other words, doing medically inclined neuroscience and understanding it are different projects. Okay, so I'm gonna keep away from somebody saying, well, it might be useful to know about the second level explainers because that's where you might make a pharmacological intervention or something like that. Fine, uh, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about understanding an explanation. So here's um, a philosopher, Han Direct, who wrote a very interesting book called Understanding Scientific Understanding. And he says, a phenomenon P is understood scientifically if and only if there is an explanation of P that is based on an intelligible theory T and conforms to the basic epistemic values of empirical adequacy and internal consistency. And then goes further to say intelligibility is when scientists can recognize qualitatively characteristic consequences of a theory without performing exact calculations. So sort of, for example, Feynman talked about this, that he could, you could look at equations and understand their implications without having to go through the full derivation. Dirac also made a similar comment. So the idea here is, is that we have to have explanatory objects for phenomena that we can do intuitive, intelligible work with, okay? We can't do science unless we have explanatory objects. And as, phenomena become more complex, the first level explainers become more abstract. And what I'm trying to argue here is you cannot expect the first level explainer to remain invariant as you go up the hierarchy from stretch reflexes to thinking any more than you could expect the first level explainer to remain invariant when you go from physics to sociology. So we have to accept that we have to change out our explanatory objects and not hope that there's gonna be one foundational one across the hierarchy, i.e. the neural circuit. So this is the idea. Um, this is a picture from Carl Craver just showing um, a system S that is behaving. Uh, and here we have psi. So system S is sighing. And this system is made up of components X, which are phying, and it is the interaction and the organization of the components X phying that lead to the system S sighing. Now, what I'm trying to argue here is that those objects X are first level explainers. So intelligible theories of a phenomenon like S need to be constructed out of first level explainers. And those first level explainers are going to be different and be a level, just one level down for the phenomenon. So for example, if you're thinking about the stretch reflex as S, then Xs could actually be individual neurons, the 1A afferent, the motor neuron, and an interneuron. There, the first level explainers would be neurons and their connections. But if phenomenon S, sighing, is something like imagining what you're gonna have for dinner tonight, then I'm gonna argue that your first level explainer is not going to be 
identifiable neurons and their connections. You're going to have to have some intermediate form of first level explainer and just accept that neurons and circuits are second level explainers as the phenomenon becomes more complex. So cognition, the view, the computational theory of mind is that cognition is semantic representations that are operated on. And so, you know, an example I can just give all of you, if I say to you, think of the word banana in your head and count the number of A's in the word banana. Okay, so you take a representation, you imagine it in your head, the word banana, and then you count the number of A's in it. I could ask you also to think of the word facetious and tell me how many vowels are in that word. Okay, so you're doing it all the time. All right, you're conjuring up a representation and then you're operating on it. And I would say that representations are first level explainers for psychology and the computations done on them. Uh, and these representations have content and they are substitutes for and are detached from stimuli. So it's gonna be very difficult to know how to construct testable first level explainers for this kind of conceptualization of cognition. And we still haven't done it. So the problem with systems neuroscience is that there's so much excitement about what you can do at the level of neurons and circuits that they've led to a new kind of circuit reductionism because you're so powerful in model systems. And this misplaced optimism has led to the idea that second level explainers, neurons and circuits, can somehow be promoted to first level explainer status for cognition. And indeed, recent interest in doing cognition in insects is an attempt to do this, which is sort of take the Sherringtonian view and find a, a very easy identifiable circuit in a insect, call it cognition, and therefore provide cognition status to what is essentially a reflex circuit. Okay, so you can see this desperate attempt to find second level explainers that can do first level explainer work. I don't think it's going to pan out. So this leads us to the question, which I'm sure you're all asking, is can neural data ever be a first level explainer of cognition? Okay, in the paper, we sort of give the word Sherringtonian for this notion of node-to-node -node connections and individual neurons versus the Hopfieldian population view of representational spaces and movement through them. And as many of you must know, we're entering this era of manifolds and state spaces and large numbers of neurons being recorded from. Um, and you can be implementational in both the Hopfieldian and Sherringtonian sense. And you can be algorithmic and computational. So in other words, I'll talk about that in a minute. You can come up with a abstraction that is computational algorithmic at the level of connectivity in the Sherringtonian sense. And you can come up with abstractions uh, like attractors for the Hopfieldian sense. So the question is, is, if you're going to have neural data that provides a first level explainer, what we argue here is that it's most likely going to be this more abstract treatment of neurons at the population level not the Sherringtonian, you know, precise connectivity, where are the interneurons, where are the excitatory interneurons, what's happening at the synapses. Rather like the case of the golden and the marsupial mole, I don't think that those details are actually necessary. So to finish then is that just like in the disciplines, we're going to have a spectrum of going from the Sherringtonian view of thinking about behavior to the Hopfieldian one. And you can see these abstract principles that you can re reveal at the Sherringtonian level. So for example, for the stretch reflex, you have this nice notion of reciprocal inhibition. For central pattern generators, you have this nice notion of the half center model. And for eye movements, David Robinson at Hopkins, who I was lucky enough to know before he died, in his notion of the neural integrator, all right? 
Now, Robinson interestingly said that when it came to cortex and cognitive phenomena, he said he had no idea how one would be able to do the kind of work that led to these notions for the stretch reflex, the CPG and eye movements, and come up with a similar kind of principle at the sort of Sherringtonian level of circuits that one could go, ah, yes, thinking, right? Um, I don't think this is going to work, okay? Um, now, as an alternative, is that we're not going to, neural data is not going to help us actually be a first level explainer. What it will be is a neural con confirmation of a task level analysis where the concepts like working memory or attention uh, or other, or, you know, error based learning, where the first level explainers are conceptual objects from the psychology vocabulary, and you just use your neural data as confirmation to break the tie between two theories. Okay, so I think it's very important to distinguish between neurons and their connections as explainers versus confirmers of explainers that don't have neurons in the sentences you use to do the explaining. So I'm actually, it was David, we actually believe that neural data will rise to the status of first level explainer for cognition, but it will probably be in this fieldian population level way of looking at things. And we're probably not going to be able to get first level explainers out of connectivity in the way that we did for stretch reflexes, CPGs and eye movements, for, for example. Um, or we just have to accept that psychology will always have the right conceptual vocabulary and we'll simply use the neural data to arbitrate between these neuron free theories. Um, so I will stop there uh, and see what you have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. You're all welcome to jump in and ask questions. Should I stop sharing? Um, how should I do this? Can I ask? Uh... How do you see computer science or mathematics in this hierarchy of uh, sciences? Yes, just, just one second. I just want to ask, um, should I stop sharing or should I not? What should I do? So I can you, see everybody. You can leave it as it is. Okay. Um, well, I think that modeling and mathematics can be used across the hierarchy, right? You can do mathematics like Hodgkin and Huxley did on the action potential, which is another very interesting example of the case I'm making all the way to sort of mathematical theories of behavior. So I would argue that the abstractions that you come up with, the explanatory objects that you use to test new theories and to design new experiments will often be very formal and mathematical, um, but that's true from a dendrite to a hunting behavior. Yeah, so, so let me, so I, we know that different sciences use mathematics and computational models in very different ways. So physicists actually, when they do neuroscience or when they do science uh, cognition, uh, they, they actually think like physicists, but they don't apply to quarks or quantum field. They apply the same methodology to essentially mathematical to, to different phenomena. So I don't really see this you know, linear way of thinking about the sciences is correct in this sense. I, 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 I think that the ontological status of a discipline versus the tools that can be used for it are different things in my view. Um, you know, I, I can be using a computer to do my history essay or using a computer to do my maths homework. I, I don't quite see why the similarity of the tools somehow collapse all the disciplines. I, I, I just don't see the logic of that. I, I have a question also. Yes. It seems to me when I, when I hear this, that this is all like limitations of our technology. And I think of, a typical example uh, of this in, in, for example, a hurricane. If we want to understand a hurricane in the Atlantic Ocean, and you say, <laughs> well, it's impossible to understand it by just the movement of single uh, particles in the, in the air. But theoretically, if you have in the K 
capabilities to understand each interaction and each factor on that, you can eventually understand the hurricane. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, um, I was saying to Omar before I came on, my, my brother's actually the president of the Santa Fe Institute. So they have discussions about complexity and emergence like this all the time, right? And what I would say to that is yes, it, you could argue that if you had a computer powerful enough to track every single particle in the hurricane, that maybe then something is understanding it. Um, but we certainly aren't, right? We will come up with some compressed summary so that we can actually transmit what we understand. We'll come up with some notion like complexity or emergence. But I agree that we should distinguish between things that may be complicated versus things that are complex and things that are just computationally really hard to do. But what I would say is as scientists, we have to, to continue conversations and to intuit new experiments and new models. We have to have compressed explanatory objects that we can think with, right? We have to. And yeah, it's a practical matter. So, yeah. so and what I'm saying is that each discipline has its own that are fairly autonomous. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't send out all your hounds to update your explanatory objects with data from any level. But when you finally do the updating, the actual sentence that you will utter will be built out of the explanatory objects of that level. So, for example, the action potential and ways to explain the action potential. It is interesting that we've since discovered the precise subunit structure of the ion channels that are responsible for the sodium and potassium going through the membrane. But if you were to explain to a student how the action potential propagates, you would not include in your sentence the detailed substructure of the subunits. They're there to make you feel comfortable that you're right, that there's something that has voltage sensitive permeability change uh, in the form of those channels, but they won't figure in your explanation. They are second level explainers for the action potential, not first level explainers. Okay, so that's all I'm saying is that it's not that radical. It's just, I think what's happened is because we have these amazing techniques and we can do circuit cracking in animal models, is we've gone back to the belief that there's this foundational, unique first level explainer, the circuit, which will sweep everything away in front of it. And you can see it on websites. I'm not creating a straw man. I could show you now 10 websites that make that kind of statement. And it's ridiculous in my view. Thank you. Yeah, I have a, I have a, a, a comment, I guess. Um, I tend to very much agree and actually tend towards the, the, your latter suggestion that we really won't really ha won't have a neural, even hot field like uh, explanatory language for, for thought or like, or really human psychology. Um, but in terms of the Sherringtonian versus Hopfieldian, one thing that comes to mind, I remember a talk Chaim gave in my first in my first year here a long time ago, where he was talking about the the kind of Philip the Philip Anderson separation of levels, where more is different, maybe depend on a huge gap, an order of magnitude of the degrees of freedom between the lower level and the higher level, mm. and I think I remember Chaim suggesting that the brain and maybe biology in general, first of all, you don't have those gaps in the, the, the numbers of degrees of freedom. And maybe the brain is actually by the force of, um, of evolution, actually in trying to exploit all those degrees of freedom and all the different scales that it has at its capacity. So maybe we don't have the possibility of the separation of scales to be able to really cleanly talk about even the Hopfieldian level without also at the same time like being linked into the lower levels. Yes. In other words, um, I, I, I think that there may be um, a sort of decaying, diminishing return of how much lower levels are need to be interrogated in order to 
construct top fieldian population level abstractions. Um, you know, it's interesting that there's a guy called Jeffrey West at the Santa Fe Institute who's done these incredible work on scaling laws in biology, right? And in particular, he's shown that there are these remarkable scale-free properties of villages, towns, and cities, right? So he can tell you, if you tell him the size of the population, he'll tell you how many traffic lights, how many miles of cabling, you know, how many gas stations there would be. In other words, there's this scale-free property. But what he can't explain is why once you get to a particular size of city, you suddenly have a ballet. You suddenly get a university specializing in dolphins. Right? In other words, there are certain properties that emerge at a certain level, which don't have any equivalent in a town or a village. All right? So in other words, there are these scale-free properties, but then there are these emergent ones, which are, require some number and maybe connections like prefrontal cortex, you know, there are thousands of connections per neuron versus a hundred in motor cortex, something like that. So I'd like to know how that claim that Heim made, how it plays out. In other words, what are the, what are the consequences of that view for the way that you speak and construct explanatory objects? when you're talking about cognition. In other words, what, what will the sentences look like? In other words, I was on a show um, recently with Buzaki, so he kept on saying that he didn't like all those psychological terms and one day they'll be retired, okay? And so I said, okay, and I'd read his book, right? I, you know, I know Yuri well, and, 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 and I said, but Yuri, your, your book is full of these terms, okay? So what, what, when do you think that there will no longer be? So you'll never use the word motivation or error or sadness. You'll just have a neural sentence instead. And he's admitted to me, it's extremely difficult to know how that sentence would sound. It would be like saying to Tolstoy or Jane Austen that one day your novels with these folk psychological terms will become extinct and will only be talking about neurons in the novels. Right, so the question just is, is what is the explanatory object that the confirmatory work at the lower level will construct? And I'm all for updating it, but you'll still end up with an abstract object that doesn't have the word neuron in the sentence. Uh, may I ask? Uh, I, uh, I would like to make a few comments. First of all, nobody is suggesting to uh, remove uh, those folk psychology, if you want term, terminology from language. They'll keep uh, being used uh, for their purpose, but it doesn't mean that they will have the same role as they used to have in the scientific discourse, which may be different. Let me give you an example of genetics, heredity, and molecular biology. You can fantasize and discuss from, you know, and write books and so on on different languages. But the truth is there is no. It used to be different languages, but today we are mixing them back and forth, and we don't care about separation of languages. This is biology. Well, I would say that if you want to discuss population genetics. I don't I didn't say population genetics. Right, but 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 there but there, there's no need when oh, when explaining you were telling me about villages and about, you know, well, well, towns. Well, well, Let's talk about genetics. Well, right, but, but, you're, but I'm just saying that it's useful to have first and second level explainers. They don't all become an equal playing field of the same kind of explainer, is all I'm saying. They are mixed. In scientific discourse, they are mixed. There is no real separation. The same paper in the same research, you will, you will mix those terminology without blushing. I, I would claim that if we sat down and read the papers together, you'd be able to say when they're using one in this particular context oh, and using another. Basis, but who cares? That's the point. They, they, I mean, the whole research paradigm is mixing them. And in one sentence, you'll see this. Another sentence, you'll see that. But it doesn't bother anybody. Well, I don't think, I, I, I just don't agree about that. Otherwise, we wouldn't have 
different journals and different disciplines and different requirements. We just have one science journal and everything would go into it. I I'm, I'm saying... I'm not saying that it's always so. I didn't say that quantum mechanics is necessarily uh, the language that is relevant to, to uh, macroscopic systems or to depending or, or, or strings and so on. Uh, it's it just that it's really on the practical case-by-case -case basis. And, and, and as Itamar quoted me, uh, biological systems, I think, are, are, are basically designed by evolution to cross those scales and, and mechanisms which typically would say, well, they are too microscopic, end up popping up in a macroscopic level and back and forth. And, and, right. there, and therefore, it will be a practical decision rather than more kind of philosophical or conceptual distinction. Right. I mean, I, 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 I think that I would like to know why it's obvious that strings and quantum mechanics are probably not needed to talk about macroscopic phenomena. And yet, yeah. once we get into the biological system, suddenly they're mixing. We, we'd have to come up with a principled way to know when the mixing happens and when it doesn't. There is a principle. If you look at the energy uh, uh, scale and time scale involved, you will see that this is this is clear separation of scales. There is no question about it. But when you look at the time scale of uh, neurons and and synapses, and you talk about milliseconds and seconds and slow time scale, there's a continuum of time scale. There is no separation. Strings, there's not continuum time scale. There is so, there is energy scales and spatial scales which are clearly orders, many orders of magnitude removed. So I'm not saying our brain is not based on strings or quarks, but the dynamics is completely irrelevant. So in other words, somebody planning to go to graduate school in 10 years time, and what happens with the dynamics of the stretch reflex can be thought about in a similar way. Whether you want to call it cognition or not, I, I don't know, I, that's fine. Whether you want to call fear response, cognitive response or not, or reflex, I, I think, I mean, it's partly political, social, it's not a scientific question. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually think it's not just epistemological, I think it's ontological, but I'm glad you said that, because I think it, I don't think it's just a um, ecumenical, pleasant mush where people can do whatever they want and it is relevant. I think that it leads to strange research projects. That's what I think it leads to. You want to start can I add here something? Yeah. So, uh, I would actually, yeah, I would really uh, like to express my support for Dr. Son Polinski's uh, view. I mean, science is basically pragmatic. So, uh, and I guess the uh, major, major sort of goals of scientific explanation is to, to be able to predict and to intervene. And if we make now guesses about like, we don't know lot, lots about critical functions, but if we make like eternal guesses what is needed and what's not needed to understand cortical functions. I think that's completely premature. And also, I'm not quite sure that Sherrington would actually like subscribe at all for what's now called the Sherringtonian view. I mean, he never said anything like what was now like uh, put into his mouth. Well, actually, that's not, con I mean, we were just using, Sherrington himself, if you read his writings, said that I'm going to start low in the spinal cord because I can't imagine how we're going to do right. it as we go right. up. That's so in other words, he was, he was implying himself intuitively, like David Robinson as well, some mm. hierarchical complexity issue that made it less amenable to whatever this particular approach was. Right. All I'm saying is, mm. is that whatever that extra, that surplus, requirement is, it's not likely to yield in the same way that the stretch reflex in the soleus muscle of the decerebrate cat does. Okay. Right? And also I would say that I do not agree that prediction and, and understanding are the same thing in the sciences. Right? I, didn't in other words, I didn't mean that. Uh, I was talking about understanding here, not about what we can predict and what we can fix or what we can simulate. Well, I wonder about the epistemology in natural sciences where you have the full understanding, but you can't intervene and predict. But it does happen, and it's interesting. In other words, and vice versa. I think you're absolutely right. In other words, 
you know, you can understand astronomy and you can't change the universe. Oh, yeah, right? sure. Absolutely. And, and the same with, uh, yeah, sure. And with evolution, the same. Right. So in other words, they, they can diverge. And I don't think they should be conflated. Right. But I think there's a lot to put into the pragmatic part of scientific language. It will be never like a sort of a uh, completely alienated from everyday language, even if it, I mean, whatever concepts we use. So I mean, basically, I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of slightly trying to expand on, on Dr. Sompolinsky's uh, points here. But I guess that's, yeah, that's it. I, I think I think that the, the the astronomy example is is not is, is wrong. It is true that we cannot change the, the sky, but we are explaining, understanding, or trying to understand astronomy based on universal, on implied universal laws, and those universal laws, in order to understand them or to and to rely on them and, and, and so on, we are doing experiments in the lab and manipulating whatever we can manipulate. So you don't have to understand even cognition by, by manipulating it, maybe necessarily, but if your understanding has some generality to it, then there will be mechanisms that you will manipulate in order to test and to enhance your understanding. But I agreed, I agreed with that. All I'm saying is, first of all, I don't think that the, the, the sort of law view of science, you know, the mechanistic view in neuroscience and biology was kind of a way to get away from this notion of initial conditions and laws that worked in physics, right? And so people said, let's go towards a mechanistic view. I'm not against intervening at lower levels to test higher level concepts and understanding. All I'm saying is that when it comes to a cognitive phenomena and you transmit an explanation to a fellow scientist, you will construct abstractions that will rely and be confirmed by and reassured by neural interventions, but they're not necessarily going to be in the explanation the way that you have them when you imagine in your head how a stretch reflex works. You're going to have something more intermediate in your explanation. And all I'm saying is we can't expect that explanatory object in the sentence to remain invariant, regardless of the biological neuroscientific phenomena. That's all I'm saying. But the point, even if I agree on, on that statement about the experiment, about this abstract and compressed object of explanation, I still am not sure that this can be can translate to a meaningful research problem. It's, I think it's a two separate Things. How do we convey? Well, I, I, I would say that what I think has happened is that it, I'm actually fighting the fact that it has led to the imposition of research paradigms. So in other words, if you're a PhD student in neuroscience and you don't do circuit-based work in a model system, it, it's very difficult now, right? So psychology and behavior are considered less mechanistic so and in fact, you, it, it, you agree that they're less mechanistic, but you say, "Who cares? I don't care." So I'm saying that I'm saying that they're all equally You're explanatory, not depending not on all, mechanisms. I'm, I'm saying that mechanism can it, can operate as a concept on any object. It doesn't have to bottom out at neurons and their connections. Yeah, so maybe I can ask a question following on some of this. Yes. I first wanted to say thanks to, to, to the organizers for this because I'm at University of Helsinki and so is Kai Kaila, who just asked the question before. And it's really nice to have, have these series. I've been coming to a lot of them. So thanks to you all for organizing. Um, so I have a kind of futuristic question building on all of this. There's this idea out there that, okay, if the brain is a machine or the brain is a computer or whatever metaphor we want to if only we understood it at a particular level, and we're not sure what that is, but if we understood it, we could build some artificial intelligence. And I don't mean a self-driving car, but I mean replicating a, a mind of a person and all of the sense of psychology, that they are hungry, they have these emotions, they have a fight with you, they have a job, all of this stuff. So, you know, a few points in your talk, I found it really interesting that you, implied maybe some of the explanations in psychology, maybe we, we never even get 
second level explanations promoted to the first level in this sort of cognitive zone. So I guess what I'm asking then, my, my question from all of this is, how do you view the development of artificial intelligence in the sense that I brought it up in the context of how you're thinking about neuroscience and what neuroscience can tell us about the mind? Can it make AI in this sense? Yeah, it's actually fascinating that, um, that thinking, you know, I mean, let me just ask you a question. I think it's really interesting that when, you know, Lee Sedol lost to AlphaGo and everyone was, you know, uh, my response to that was the opposite, which is, isn't it amazing that a human being who, who also has pizza and has love affairs and goes for walks plays Go so well, right? When AlphaGo, it's all it does, right? So in other words, it's kind of remarkable. And also, I think it's really interesting that when it comes to trying to test AI, we go after benchmarks, right? Rather than just general common sense, which AI is hopeless at, right? So in other words, what I think is really interesting is both neuroscience when it comes to thinking, and let's call thinking just the common sense overt Kahneman system two stuff that we do, right? Um, and AI have hit the same impasse. They're both equally unable to even begin to explain how just thinking with semantic representations happen, right? So in other words, both of them have hit a wall. The gap is there for both of them. Now, who's gonna win? Who's gonna help whom? I'm completely ecumenical and open-minded about that. But I just think that there are two strategies that one can employ about this. One can say, don't worry about semantics, take care of the syntax and it will look after itself. And that if we keep on going down this road, that if you can identify cats in images and you can beat players at go, then we'll eventually get to Kahneman system two. But I think we're stuck in a procedural rut in the animal models and in AI. It's a sort of algorithmic procedural approach to things rather than an overt one shot semantic one. And I don't know who's going to win, actually, to put it that childish way. I mean, it's not a race, but I don't know. I, but I think both are stuck at the moment. And you wouldn't say there's that, that, that your argument is precluding the idea that, that we could ever make progress. No, I'm, I, I, I think, I think um, uh, Arthur C. Clarke had a law of old scientists, which is whatever an old scientist says will not happen, will happen, <laughs> right? So I think it's the most dangerous thing to do is to say we'll never get X or Y. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? So all I'm saying is um, that I just don't see the current projects as unless it just happens by chance they just don't have that qualitative ingredient uh ontologically that we want i don't feel it at the moment anyway and you can either be deflationary and go oh don't worry about it it's all the same and it will it will all come out in the wash or you go yeah this is actually something that we still can't get our heads around what sort of conceptual structure will we need to get to this piece. And I would prefer the latter admission rather than just keep on going and it will just happen. Well, on your example of uh, AlphaGo and Lee Sedol and your, there were two interpretations. It's impressive that Lee Sedol could even uh, stay with a single machine. I've, I would look at that differently. The people, AlphaGo is an algorithm and a set of coaches, if you like, a machine and a set of people who point the machine in a particular direction. Uh, after beating Lee Sedol, they went back to being a grandmaster in chess. And through self-play, through self-training and self-play with coaches, they reached the, the level of a person as unique as Lee Sedol, but in an entirely different game in six months, doesn't that uh, set an example of some sort that we should be aware of and think about? I think that sort of transfer learning is really interesting. Um, but um, I, all I'm saying is what would be really interesting is when AlphaGo wins and cares that it did.
right? And Lisa Doll retired, right? He was so upset. I don't see AlphaGo when it lost one of the four games going, damn, I lost, right? Where does that come from? Well, the coaches probably felt bad on the. Uh, but those game. are human. Th those are human beings. I'm saying, what is going to be the architecture that makes it not just be able to algorithmically, by brute force, win, but be upset that it lost? It is upset. Reinforcement learning upsets it. I I, I think that's using. Um, it is upset. It's, that's, that's In a metaphor fact, you can me. quantify regret. Takes it. Uh, I, 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 I think I, I think that's a that's the use of metaphor in my view. This is the object of, it, of uh, understanding that you want to. Yeah, um, I, no, I'm just saying that I, I think it's a little bit dangerous <laughs> to go that it's upset. In other words, what the, the word upset is doing work for you that is a, being applied in a way where there's this surplus meaning that is slightly cheekily being used with. <laughs> And I just don't think it's, I mean, in my view, it's, 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 it's sort of... That those term, terminologies, those terms of the language is unique to humans, of course, by definition, you will never apply it to machines, whatever. Well, I'm not saying that, actually. I'm a functionist. I think that one day you might have a machine that will be upset. I'm not saying that, it, I mean, I don't know what would be needed, but I'm actually not saying that you couldn't have a machine that's truly upset. It is upset now. I, I just don't agree with that. <laughs> right. yeah, you, could have, you could have a machine which oh, retreats from a particular answer. strategy. You're upset. There's a negative global signal that says bad, bad, bad. You lost. That's it. I, 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 I do not think that they are uh, identity mapped the way you're saying. I don't think they are. May yeah. I please? May I talk please? May I speak? Yes, of yeah, course. Yeah. Yes. Shalom. My name is Ranan, and uh, I, uh, in the last uh, Heller conference that was uh, in the, uh, at the university and not in the Zoom, or maybe the prelast, I don't remember the name of the lecture, the, the, the person, uh, I'm sorry, he started showing how many diseases are in psychology, and then he said all of them today are not recognized. He showed the books about 70 years ago. And he said that the big difference is the, it's the way that we look at things without any base to connect it. And I'm going to the beginning of your lecture where you show the overlapping between psychology, biology, chemics, uh, physics, etc. And I think that the big gap is between psychology and biology and all the rest. Since you can as he says, support your vision and understand deeper things as you go deeper and deeper. And it's all in one connection, I would say. I, can, I, can, I believe it is like this. I understand it in this way, even for myself. But when you say this is a neur neurotic person, or he has this disease, and you cannot, no, I, I won't talk about disease because this is more difficult. I said, but about the personalities, you decided he is a special and different personality than the other one. Another one will say, no, no, it's not, they are the same, but this is different. And here we have the, the misconnection, I think, and how to jump from one field of psychology to the other of the, uh, the sciences that is mentioned in your first or second slide. Thank you. So just to talk about that, I mean, it's another topic entirely, but let's take psychiatric conditions. Right, um, and we haven't had a new drug for the for the treatment of psychiatric conditions for fifty years. Okay, you could maybe talk about ketamine infusions, but those have been, as you know, overrated after the initial excitement. Okay, so we've basically been with the neurotransmitter hypotheses of psychiatric disease for half a century, and it's a myth actually that they do better than behavioral therapy, for example. Okay, now. Let's talk about a psychiatric, let's take obsessive compulsive hand washing. People who wash their hands all the time, okay? Now it's really interesting when you think about it, and this has been pointed out, is to obsessively wash your hands is because you think you might get germs. 
which means you have to be at a point in the cultural history of the world where we knew that microscopic germs can cause disease if you don't wash your hands. So therefore you have this very interesting condition which relies on the semantic knowledge of germs and then there's this additional strange ex excessive hand washing that happens afterwards. So the boundary between knowing about germs and worrying about dying and some neurotransmitter discussion about why you're doing it too much is very difficult to point out. And what I would say is there isn't going to be a, just a neurotransmitter explanation for why you excessively wash your hands because you're gonna also have to explain why you know about germs and worried about dying. So you're gonna need a multi-level explanation. And that's why I said at the very beginning of my talk that fixing the disorder with a drug and explaining its phenomenology are not going to be happening at the same level. And we have to be pluralistic about our explanatory object for why you're washing your hands all the time versus how you treat washing your hands all the time. And what I think has happened is there's a belief that the levels for both should be the same. And I think that's actually erroneous. Thank you. There's a lot to think about. Any more questions? I think that we are underestimating the world around us in these parameters. There is, there seems to be a reason for why drugs for mental disorders have not been developed over the past two decades almost. And, and it's financial and political and doesn't have much to do with us. I was once discussing with a chief scientist from Roche, and he looked at me and he said, so tell me what part of the cost of developing a drug is invested in the basic research, in its discovery? And the answer was 2%. The, the cost of developing a therapeutic is mainly the financial coverage of all of those people who go to clinics and convince the doctors to prescribe it. And the cost of the big pharmaceutical companies that pay a lot to keep their position in spite of politics. And we see that in the United States today, I think. Well, all I would say to that is, of course, you're right that there's a many unfortunate capitalistic cynical reasons why but i would say that if you look at you know people at nimh and in universities who i would hope are just more curiosity based they also believe in a magic single level monotherapeutic bullet that will work so i would say that there's an ideology scientifically that there'll be a magic bullet at one level that is better than having people go to orchards and go camping and be with friends if they're depressed because we just want to get it. And I would say that that is yeah. dominant even when you factor out the more pragmatic issues that you're talking about. Okay. We do okay. believe in magic bullets. We have this belief that there'll be a drug for everything. And I'm just saying that it's very much a sort of reductionist mindset that, you know, to Heim's point, it has consequences, right? Many, many approaches to psychiatric disease have fallen by the wayside mm -hmm. and have stopped because there's a belief that there'll be a drug acting on a receptor that will get the job done. So there are consequences to these single level monomanias that dominate in, in areas of science, unfortunately. Yeah, I take that. Now you are, but now you are not making the distinction between explanation and understanding an intervention. Now you are talking about the intervention part. And I think, we, I think today there is a general awareness that this single mechanism, a single molecule, a single gene, a single track pathway, uh, a hypothesis is, is wrong. And I think it still didn't, we didn't see new drugs coming out of the multi, 
multi uh, uh, multiple mechanism parallel mechanism approach. But this is now again we're talking about mechanisms and about intervention. I think it's a separate question. For they are separate, and I made them separate. All I would say is that I think they share a sort of ideological basis about foundational levels. <clears throat> Okay, uh, I think we'll have to stop here. Uh, thank you, John, for a fascinating discussion. And I think it's a very good uh, ending for the semester. And uh, please thank John on your way out. And we'll see you all the next semester. And thanks for inviting me. And I hope that I'm invited back. <laughs> 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 right, it was really fun. Thank you all very much and stay safe and stay well, okay? Thank you. Thank you very All much. right. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.